Um, I'd like to thank Albion English. Um, and I'm from LA, not San Francisco, but it's the same state, so we're pretty close. Um, I'd like to thank Florian for the invitation and the organizers, and also very much like to thank René Jean for following him. Um, usually, I have to do a lot of adjusting of microphones, being that uh, we're comparable in vertical dimension. Um, we you could call us the short part of the program, so hopefully we'll catch up in time for Mario's talk. And it's a pleasure to be in the same program with Mario. We haven't seen him for a while, so. Uh, I've been asked to talk about mucositis, and of course, René Jean has uh, really covered a lot of this, so I want to thank him for that as well. What I'm gonna try to uh, emphasize is, um, current systematic review-based guidelines that are uh, developed for the mucositis study group of MASK, and you're gonna hear MASK through the whole meeting, I think, and we all invite you to, to join us uh, in this, uh, I guess, necessary work. Um, and I'll also try to talk a little bit about impact, uh, just a little more than uh, René Jean has, has done. Um, so firstly, one of the things about the oral complications, particularly in head and neck cancer, but not just limited to that, is that there's a continuum of care needs from early detection, diagnosis, treatment of pre-existing conditions before, but also the acute needs, which I'll focus on mucositis, and then the survivorship and chronic care needs, which uh, René Jean has just uh, discussed briefly. And of course, all of these have an impact on cost of care and quality of life in particular. Uh, and of course, uh, when we get to the uh, refreshment break, you'll appreciate some oral comfort and maybe some oral stimulation which we can talk about another time. So why does this matter in a potentially fatal disease? And, and this is part of survivorship care, palliative care, and improvement in quality of life. Well, in, in the case of mucositis, in studies where patients have been asked what's been the most troubling or, or difficult toxicity or side effect that they've experienced, it's been oral mucositis in head and neck cancer patients and in stem cell transplant. Um, so it's common, it's debilitating. The pain affects uh, a function of the oral cavity in a general sense, as well as just being painful. Uh, it can impact cancer therapy and limit doses and completion of therapy or lead to hospitalizations, and all of this can increase cost. But cost beyond the standard sort of association of, of medical management. There are many social, personal costs, and other out-of-pocket expenses and costs uh, that are, are just not included in the equation. I want to talk just a little bit about one aspect of that a little later. So the impact is great on quality of life. It impacts completing cancer therapy. We believe that the, the true incidence is underestimated because it's underreported often by patients. And even in studies, it's usually reported on the basis of a patient report, not even a patient query, so that patients may not present the complication or report it to the provider or even in a study setting unless directly asked. Uh, and that underestimates the incidence. And of course, oral is often not well assessed by the medical and nursing community, whereas it's a focus, say, of the dental community. Um, so in studies where we've looked at what is the true incidence, for example, in breast cancer, um, looking at mucositis as a complication, we, most studies estimated a 10 to 12% over a period of years in, in the literature review, but on a prospective, uh, directly assessed uh, outcome, it was 25%. So we, we think that there's good evidence for underreporting. And this, of course, affects, uh, maybe I'll point out where I am, pain and swallowing, uh, that affects longevity, well-being, uh, energy intake, uh, and in fact, maybe the ability to recover from the toxicity that we're delivering. And there is a question about increasing toxicities in the elderly populations uh, that we are able to treat. Um, in some studies, so these are chart review studies, but basically the mucosal uh, toxicity leads to increased use of analgesics with their inherent side effects, uh, increased weight loss, and increased use of feeding tubes. And these are big drivers of cost of care. Of course, increased hospitalizations and radiation therapy delivery may affect outcomes. Um, another study looked at uh, mucositis occurring in head and neck cancer patients in approximately 90% where grade three or four, meaning ulcerative and severe involvement, is present in about two-thirds. Uh, oral mucositis is more common in current therapies with combined chemo-RT, and also now with targeted therapies as well, although the mechanisms uh, may be different and the condition presents differently. So severe mucositis, again, it's associated with severe pain, and look at the impact of this particular review. Weight loss, more than 5%, 60% versus 17%, and increased cost of care in this study uh, at MD Anderson. 
Um, so the impacts are, are significant. Now the other thing that I think uh, we think about resource utilization um, when we talk in just a couple minutes about the professional impact of this. Uh, 75 patients were looked at, three quarters had mouth pain, and 85% were on opioids. And why I bring up this study is mucositis pain is present in almost in this number of patients despite use of opioids at planned and prescribed estimated necessary dosing and schedule. In other words, pain is significant despite standard current pain management. And then, of course, this affects tube feeding and hospitalization as shown in this study. Um, again, mouth and throat soreness uh, study um, done with uh, Dorothy Keefe, uh, president, former president of MASK. Uh, present, they present with mouth and, th and throat soreness in an, in leading to the use of non-prophylactic G-tubes or feeding tubes. Unplanned office visits increased by 40%, and in this study, 20% uh, increase in hospitalization. So you've seen this, um, and this is a standard radiation and induced mucositis, and this you can't see, it shows a secondary candidiasis on top of the primary tissue damage, making the symptoms worse and both requiring management. So the last and the impact of this is not so much the impact on patients and the impact on cost of the healthcare system, but the impact on the professionals uh, was an interesting study uh, published in 2010. And what they did was they interviewed 50 radiation oncologists and 51 oncology nurses who treated a minimum of six to 12, uh, well, minimum of six patients per month with head and neck cancer therapy. And they had standard therapies, but, but the impact or, the, or the, the message in this paper was the radiation oncologist estimated they spent additional 7.2 hours during treatment on mucositis and mucositis management. Nurses, 12.1 hours uh, of time managing mucositis, and this certainly increased as the therapy progressed. Uh, we know that the symptoms develop over time as the dose accumulates. That therefore, the impact, again, on cost of care can be dramatic when you consider professional time, even if our interventions are not as effective as we'd like them to be. For example, opioids for pain relief is clearly not sufficient, and we, we need to do better. So just to give you a quick summary, this is not the only place that we see mucositis, and it's not just cytotoxic chemotherapy and radiation. It's, it's many of the new targeted agents. It's also potentially, and I think there is a talk on immunotherapies tomorrow, uh, that will affect oral environment. And so as we use different therapies, and, so, and often we may be combining these into a, a three and four part um, mechanism of cancer therapy, we will see different conditions, different outcomes that have different mechanisms, and therefore we will need different interventions um, that are, are not standard for the cytotoxic uh, therapies. Um, so what I want to do is just go quickly over the current guidelines from the MASK mucositis, uh, oral mucositis study group that were just published in 2014. This is uh, uh, the re most recent update. It's divided into prevention and for therapy, meaning um, upfront to reduce severity and toxicity and to use once the condition has, has developed. So the recommended for prevention with adequate levels of evidence to allow a recommendation to be made were cryotherapy prior to bolus chemotherapy, 5-FU is the example, which is not used as often as it used to be, at least in our settings. Um, but for short half-life chemotherapy delivered at high dose um, bolus treatment, this may be an effective mechanism. And there is controlled um, outcome data to show that. Uh, Palifermin or KGF-1 uh, is a uh, growth factor that has been recommended uh, with level two evidence in auto stem cell transplant and very specifically combining chemotherapy and total body radiation. And then this group has uh, recommended low level light or laser therapy as Rene Jean discussed for the transplant patients receiving high dose chemotherapy with or without TBI with a, a, a level of evidence of grade two uh, identified. Um, you'll see the radiation therapy recommendation shortly. Uh, benzidamine, which is uh, available in Europe, was recommended for radiation therapy alone as a single agent with a strong level of evidence. And recommended for treatment was 
patient-controlled analgesia for oral pain and stem cell transplant with, again, level of evidence grade two. And like most areas of medicine, but maybe this in particular, where, where the studies are both more difficult and also require multidisciplinary centers so they can be conducted, we have limited data. So it allows us not to be as, uh, I guess, forthright or as specific as we'd like to be. Now, suggestions for preventive actions, these are not as strong as recommendations, are oral care protocols, good oral hygiene, no dental abscesses and periodontal infections prior to treatment, uh, removal of lo local irritating conditions. Uh, this is level ev evidence grade three. Uh, there's limited literature evidence, but there's certainly consensus of opinion. Uh, oral cryotherapy for high-dose melphalan was given a level of evidence grade three and suggested, again, a short half-life chemotherapy with mucosal toxicity. And low-level laser therapy uh, for radiation therapy in head and neck cancer patient was provided a level of evidence grade two and therefore suggested as an intervention. Now, suggestions for pain management uh, in addition to the PCA you saw as a recommendation in transplant patients in particular was transdermal fentanyl, um, a grade level of evidence grade three, two percent morphine and 0.5 percent doxepin rinses. These are uh, agents or, or deliveries that you may not have heard of and morphine can be compounded in a liquid um, and providing s significant local analgesic effect uh, with a longer duration of up to four to eight hours in, in most of the studies. Um, the use of doxepin was uh, first uh, initiated as, as looking at a means of uh, preventing some of the neuropathic consequences of pain on mucosa, uh, which is probably a, a large part of the reason why opioids alone are not effective. And in, in the studies, um, and one double-blind is just being uh, published, um, shows, uh, again, analgesic effect that's lasting 48 hours from a single rinse uh, and may be uh, beneficial, and there are continuing studies on that protocol. Now, as important as what we recommend, it's what we don't recommend. Um, and there's been a number of studies looking at antimicrobial delivery uh, on mucosal surfaces to reduce oral colonization uh, and with the idea that this would reduce mucositis and it hasn't happened. Uh, in, in any of the trials, it's not been shown to be effective. Uh, coating agents, sucralfate or carafate in the United States also has been recommended but, uh, in the past, but there's just no evidence of efficacy across studies. So again, it's recommended against. Um, recommendations, I should mention, not to confuse chlorhexidine with its anti-caries and periodontal disease effect. This is specifically for mucositis. And again, recommendations against use in treatment, in other words, of pain, uh, was sucralfate and IV glutamine by this group. Uh, suggestions against for prevention, again, mucositis is not affected by um, antimicrobials, although the oral health in other ways might be. GMCSF mouth rinse has been uh, studied. Other uh, um, agents like misoprostol and others have been looked at, and they're not recommended based upon the evidence available. So the trends then, just to sum up, in oncology therapy that impact mucositis is we are in head and neck cancer in, in general, increasing toxicities for increasing cure rates. We're increasing the use of targeted therapies, which are adding another mechanistic process to the condition that we have to manage. We're decreasing the toxicities, however, in stem cell transplant with MIDI transplant reduced intensity conditioning. And Kepavans is approved in the U.S. by the FDA for an intervention. Again, we had recommended it. Um, oral care and cancer therapy uh, it will develop with new therapies. So the impact on quality of life is significant. It's a lifetime survivorship issue. It's certainly acute that we understand um, based on what I mentioned earlier. And then personalized medicine will change things but will increase new toxicities. Uh, and I just wanted to end with uh, two things. One is this poem that was published actually in Cancer some years ago and sort of describes the patient outcome and you can read it but she's, this patient, Anita, describes the pain is like a fish hook is stuck in her throat. Her teeth become enemies and they feel like they're coated with barbed wire. And I think one of the important summaries of this poem is that pain lengthens time. And I just had a patient last week that added uh, a more, I guess, a, a brief description of how he felt with his mucositis towards the end of treatment. He said he'd rather fight three big guys in a back alley than take one teaspoon of oatmeal. And so we have an important impact on outcomes and, uh, and, and patient uh, description is, is, is critical, I think, in understanding the nature of the problem. So with that, I'd like to end. 
And uh, you know, it's a brief rundown of the guidelines as they exist based on current data that we hope to improve over time. Again, I'd like to thank you for the invitation and Mario is coming up.